So there was this farmer, and he was driving his cart of vegetables to the market uh, when he got hit head on uh, by a truck, and he sustained some severe injuries. He was in the hospital uh, for quite a while, and then he was suing um, not only the driver, but the trucking company. And so he was on the witness stand, and the lawyer said, uh, so when the officer arrived, uh, did they ask you how you were doing? And the farmer said, yes. And he said, what was your reply? Well, I told the officer, I never felt better in my life. And the lawyer says, well, then how can you, if you said that, be now suing for some serious damages? Can you explain that? And the farmer said, yeah. Well, when the um, officer arrived, you know, my horse had been thrown and my dog had been thrown and I'd been thrown and I was bleeding there in the ditch. And then I noticed the officer walk up to my horse, who had had both its legs broken and was wincing in agony, and he took out his gun, put it to his head, and put him out of his misery. And then he walked over to my dog, who had, uh, had a broken back and was in a lot of pain uh, and, and uh, groaning, and he put his gun to his head, and he took him out of his misery. Then he walked over to me, and he said, so how you feeling? And I thought under the circumstances, it was in my best interest to say, I never felt better in my life. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the ninth commandment is, uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. You know, and to bear false witness means um, to not lie, you know, to not misrepresent or to manipulate or exaggerate or create a false impression. You know, to not bear false witness means also not to gossip, not to spread rumors, not to betray others. I mean, this commandment is really talking about being truthful and being honest in all of our relationships and all of our interactions. And you know, sometimes it's not easy for us to be totally honest uh, all the time uh, and never lie. How many people were ever, ever asked a question and it was uncomfortable for you to be totally honest uh, and totally truthful? Anybody ever had that experience? You know, kind of like, how do I look in this outfit? <laughs> or, um, did you like that gift I gave you for your birthday of the painting of dogs playing poker? Or... Don't you think that my baby is the cutest baby that you've ever seen? You know, being honest, you know, being truthful is one of the things we're going to talk about as we wrap up our five-week series on the Ten Commandments. You know, it was inspired by Georgiana uh, Tree West, uh, who was a minister, wrote the book in 1944. And she really says that the Ten Commandments are the cardinal laws, the foundational laws of how to live our lives spiritually. And just at face value, all the things that it says are powerful, important lessons for living. But we can actually go deeper spiritually, and when we understand and apply them, they actually deepen our connection and relationship with God, and they actually open our lives to the flow of God's goodness and abundance. You know, week one, there was uh, the first uh, commandment, which is, thou shalt have no other gods before me, which really means that God is our source. That is the source of all of our good and means that God should be our priority. God should be the most important thing that we turn to first, to seek, to ask, to listen, uh, to connect, because all things flow from God. God is the source. Uh, the second commandment is to create no graven images or idols to worship. And even though God is our source and all abundance comes through God, sometimes we can put other things first, like money, thinking money is our source that power or status, these things, will bring us joy and happiness and kind of it distances us from our connection uh, uh, to God and, and putting God first. Uh, we, uh, the, the third uh, commandment is to not take the Lord's name in vain. You know, and that really tells us about the power of our words. You know, that God said, let there be light and there was light and shows the example that we really speak our experiences uh, and our situations into existence by the words that we use. And the most important one we need to be careful of is the words that we attach to I am. You know, saying I am poor or I am a hot mess or I am a, a loser, you know, really identifies a spirit of God within, within us, our I am, with a lot of negativity. And that's just not the truth. It's a misuse of that uh, power. So we need to speak words of positivity, 
words of, of, of abundance, wor words of joy and happiness. You know, then it was uh, keep uh, the Sabbath uh, holy. And that is saying that realize the value and the importance of rest. You know, that even for our bodies, even for our minds, even for our spirits, there needs to be a time of quiet for renewal, you know, for re re rejuvenation in all areas of our lives, and especially our level of creativity. You know, that um, rest is an important part. Like, we do our work, and it's an important part of the creative process. We do what is ours to do, but then we get, hand it over to God to allow that to be done and to refrain. Um, and then we looked at uh, to honor our mother and father. When you think about it, our parents are clearly the first relationship we ever had. And it, uh, it kind of affects all the other relationships. So to honor and, and to love and appreciate the role that our parents played in providing for us and giving us the foundation we need. And even if our parents weren't as good as we wanted them to be, still honor and still thank them for the role that they played in our lives. You know, thou shalt not kill is not only the obvious thing, but the spiritual message is not only not kill, but bring more life into life. You know, that I, I, I saw a poster once and it said, withholding love kills. That when we close our heart and consciously withhold love from others, it, it, it is deadening our experience of life. You know, tithing is another thing, the law of giving and receiving. As we give, we put things into motion in life and, and it creates more life, more increase and abundance. You know, when we serve others, you know, it circulates and brings us greater connection and a greater level of, of joy. And last week we looked at do not commit adultery. And that is about a misuse of our, not just our sexual energy, but our life energy. You know, some, it, 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 sometimes we leak energy by investing it in things that just aren't healthy or aren't positive, aren't productive. And the way to cure that is to get clear how you really want to spend your energy. Get clear how you want to focus uh, your life, your, your actions, your thoughts, and your intentions. And last week, we also looked at um, thou shalt not steal. You know, stealing is trying to look for something for nothing. And the truth is, that's not how life works. It is the law of attraction, the law of compensation, the law of cause and effect. That we need to not try and get something for nothing. We need to work and apply the principles to attract more abundance in our lives. Today, we're look, going to look at uh, commandment number nine. Um, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor and uh, do not uh, covet. And so, in some ways, I think we all tell some untruths. We all um, tell some lies uh, sometimes. And the thing is that we don't always want to own it. We try to rationalize it. I really wasn't lying. You know, I was just bending the truth slightly. You know, uh, it was mostly true uh, or, you know, it was just a little white lie. You know, we have all kinds of different excuses. And sometimes we lie because we want to have a personal gain. We lie uh, because we want to avoid getting in trouble. Sometimes we lie thinking we're protecting someone else's feelings or, um, you know, or protecting ourselves in some way. Brad Blanton wrote a book called Radical Hon Honesty, and he said that all forms of lying and for whatever reasons we're lying, that all lying is harmful. All lying damages our respect and relationship for ourselves as well as uh, affecting the relationship and the people that uh, we are connected to. Interestingly, he said that all lies cause harm, but there's one li uh, type of lie that is even more harmful than we realize, and it's lies of omission. It is a lie of not telling people um, the truth that really should know the truth. Withholding information that's vital and important in that role, in that relationship, that withholding it, he says, causes more damage. But honesty and telling the truth is actually the opposite. It is healing. You know, it brings a greater connection, greater awareness, greater understanding, and greater uh, closeness. And he says that even though honesty is kind of hard, or really hard, that it is always the best choice. And so here are the things he says that improves in relationship. He says that relationships will get closer and healthier with more honesty. Relationships will improve over time when honesty is practiced consistently. The quality of our friendships and associations will improve. That our mental health as well as our physical health will get better. We'll have less stress. We will feel better, feel better about ourselves, and actually trust and feel more confident in ourselves as we are more honest. 
And he says that the more, more honest we are, the more other people will begin to trust us and the more we will live more authentically. This commandment teaches us two things, one on the literal level and one on the spiritual level. And so the first one is to look at our relationship and how much we practice honesty in our lives. And so a question for all of us is, you know, so where in our lives are we not being as honest and truthful as we can be? And who in our lives is it time for us to be more honest with? Whether it's our primary relationship or a family or a friend or uh, someone in our work. You know, the reality is for us as human beings, being honest scares us to a certain level. I mean, there is a fear that the person might hate us, the fear that they might reject us, a fear that they may think less of us or that we might look uh, foolish or get uh, rejected. Now, speaking honestly with kindness and love he says, will always lead to some positive result. Even if the relationship changes, even if there's a rough patch, you know, even if um, it takes some time to process, he said, honesty is absolutely vital if we want to live our best life. Honesty is absolutely vital if we want to be our best self. If we want to be true to ourselves, we, we got to have more honesty. If we want to live more authentically, honesty needs to be there. You know, uh, Joseph Sugarman wrote a book called Success Forces, and he says, every time we're honest, you know, every time we're honest, he says, a force will draw you towards peace, success, and happiness. And every time you lie or withhold, that that force will draw you further and further away from peace, success, and happiness. How many people know um, that if you were more honest in different areas of your, your life, that your life would improve? and you would feel a greater sense of happiness and peace. Anybody? And so here are the three things. Number one is, first, pay attention to where you're honest and pay attention where you have a hard time being honest. Second is then ask yourself, why? Why am I afraid to be more honest? What do I think that result is going to be? And then the third one is to just practice being more honest in those areas that scare you as well as practice uh, being uh, honest in areas that don't scare you. You know, if we all want a better life, we need to not bear false witness. We need to not be dishonest about ourselves and within our relationships and all the key uh, areas where we interact with people. Now, now let's look, that was a literal level, now let's look at, at, the, at the spiritual level. You know, spiritually, do not bear false witness means do not buy into the appearance of lack or troubles or situations in your life that don't feel as positive or ideal as we'd like. Don't get stuck there and think life is never get better and, and there's no answer or solution for this situation. Don't ever think that, that, that things are hopeless and, or our problems are too big. And so how many people, you know, I've heard of or remember uh, The Man of La Mancha, that, that, that musical? It, it was just like one of my favorites when, when I first started uh, watching theater. It's about this old guy named Alonzo Quijana. People think he's kind of nuts and kind of crazy. And he becomes this knight dubbing himself uh, Don Quixote de la Mancha. Anyway, he sees, um, you know, beauty where other people see ugliness. And it is, they think he's crazy, but there's kind of some wisdom in what he's saying. And my favorite line is when he says to his sidekick, uh, Sancho, facts are the enemy of the truth. <laughs> facts are the enemy of the truth. Sometimes we get so caught up in the, in the facts, in the details, that we don't always have the perspective to focus on the higher truth. That's why Jesus said, do not judge by appearances, but judge by righteous, uh, by righteous judgment. Don't, don't judge by the, the, the details and the facts of what's going on. Go to a higher place, you know, to, the, the, and, and that's where we need to bear uh, witness. You know, sometimes the, the facts can seem overwhelming. Our situations can feel hopeless. Or it feels like there's just, this thing's never going to work out. And so it's important for us to not let that control us, and we need to bear witness to the truth, that God is our source, that God is greater than this thing, that there is a solution and answer, even though I can't see it right now, Spirit has that. God is my provider. God is the creator. You know, through all God, you know, through all, you know, all, what am I trying to say? With God, all things are possible. You know, that our situations are not hopeless. We need 
to make sure that we don't bear witness to lack and limitation, but we bear witness to the truth of God's goodness and abundance. A perfect example of this is uh, the feeding of the 5,000 the, the, with, you know, 5,000 people hungry and only two or three fish. The facts didn't look good. The appearances didn't look good. But Jesus did not buy into that, you know. He did a few things that were just powerful. First thing he had them do was to sit down. So in a situation, you know, when things aren't going, we need to, like, calm down and relax. And then the second thing he did was he looked up. He didn't look at the details on the problem. He looked to a higher consciousness, to a, a higher place for possibilities and solution. And then he took what he had. He acknowledged that that good was there. Sometimes when things aren't going that well, we think what we have is not enough. You know, we start putting down what it is that we, we have because we don't have what we want. But he acknowledged the good that was there, blessed it, you know, and opened a space, you know, for a solution. Open a space for things to multiply and increase, you know. And then he... He gave it out. He shared it. He put it into action, and it was transformed in an amazing and, a, and wonderful way. You know, do not bear witness to lack, but bear witness to the truth of God's presence. So I ask you, is there, do you have a feeding of the 5,000 situation in your life that the facts don't look as good as you'd like? And what are you bearing witness to? To the lack and limitation? Or are you willing to bear witness to the truth that God is your source? that all things are working together for your highest good, that God means us for good, and good things will come forth uh, from it. I am here to bear witness to the truth of God's abundance in all situations. I am here to bear witness to the truth of God in all situations. Let's affirm that together. I am here to bear witness to the truth of God's abundance in all situations. Take a deep breath. I am here to bear witness to the presence and power of God in my life. Together, I am here to bear witness to the presence and power of God in my life. I am here to bear witness. Together, I am here to bear witness. And we're here to bear witness to the power of honesty and the power of the truth and the abundance and goodness of God in all situations. Now, the tenth uh, commandment says, Thou shalt not covet uh, thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or donkey, or ox, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. How many people have ever had even a moment or two where you thought, man, I wish I was living that person's life? Anybody ever have that? Okay, apparently just myself, uh, apparently. But sometimes we can think that, man, I wish I was as successful as that guy. You know, I wish I had as much wealth. I wish I had as nice a house. You know, I, I wish I was, had a, as much, um, you know, physical strength and athletic ability. Whatever it is, you know, we sometimes have those situations. Now, if you look at it, coveting, you know, having a desire for someone else's stuff does not sound as bad as killing or uh, adultery, uh, or, or lying or stealing. It doesn't sound as bad, but apparently it is. And that's why it's number 10. And the thing about it is, it is, the, it is all in the idea of thought. It is the idea that you want someone else's stuff. The idea that there is not enough. It is the inner realm of trying to create an activity of cause and effect. And that is what is behind lying. That is the idea behind uh, killing or, or adultery. It, it is the idea of coveting. And coveting really is about um, misdirected desire. There's nothing wrong with desiring something. In fact, it's a good and important part of the creative process. But where it goes awry is we have that desire, but we don't look to God or spiritual law or faith to fulfill that desire. We look by getting what someone else already has. You know, and the idea thing is, it's not even just getting what they have. It is even the idea of believing that that's how life uh, works, that that, that, that 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 is some good idea because it's not steeped in faith. It's not steeped in love. It's steeped in selfishness. It is steeped in an idea of lack. Let me give you an idea of uh, coveting. 
And it's a bit of an extreme idea, but just go with me on it. How many people remember the Lord of the Rings? Everybody remember the Lord? You remember Gollum or Smeagol? He coveted the ring. You know, he was just, he would manipulate, he would lie, he would do whatever it took because that's what he wanted. You know, and again, whether he got it or not, that it is that thought process in, in our heads and minds to think that someone else has my good. Ever have the thought, like, what, you ever felt like when someone else succeeds, that means, you know, I fail. If they have more, that means I have less. You know, we have this idea. Anybody ever have the moment and experience because there's a sign of covetousness that we don't always acknowledge, but we have a hard time being happy for someone when they succeed. At some level, that is an idea of coveting. It's like, oh, man, they took mine. Is If we're really honest, th those thoughts are, are pretty deep within ourselves, and they tend to lead to unhappiness and emptiness, you know, rather than joy and fulfillment. Instead of saying, wow, they succeeded, that means there's lots of abundance, and I can attract my good too. You know, we go to a place of feeling bad because they are doing well. Coveting limits and kind of short circuits the process of create, creation and manifestation in our lives. So here are five ways for us to overcome uh, that uh, mindset of covet, uh, coveting. The first one is to remember God. Remember that God is our source. To, to remember, you know, that uh, we live and move and have our very being in the abundance of God's peace and love and joy. That, uh, to remember God, put God first. God is our source. The second thing is to remember who you are. You're a child of God. You are the light of the world. You are the temple of the living God. You are a powerful spiritual being. That's the truth of who you are. You don't need other people's stuff. You are a powerhouse. And two things about that to remember is, well, that means, one, you're a co-creator with God. You are, are, you are a co-creator. And the second one is, you are fully responsible for your life. You have all the resources. And we sometimes forget that. It's to be fully responsible. I am a co-creator. That I am a powerful spiritual being. The third is to use the power of our desire. Is to think very clear about what is it that I want? What is it that I want to create? What is it that I want to achieve? Who is it that I want to become? What, what is the difference that I want to make? We will not covet other people's stuff when we know we're powerful and we're clear about what it is that we want to have or attract and create. And then the fourth thing is to utilize the power of our consciousness. You know, we could pray for something and just get it. So let, let's say we pray to win the lottery. We win the lottery. They sh the studies show that after a year, people who win the lottery don't have that money and they're not as happy. Do you know why? Because it's not just the thing. The question is, do you have the consciousness to handle and manage those things in life. So instead of just praying for success or a new relationship or a new job, pray for the consciousness of someone who maintains and handles uh, success. Pray for the consciousness of someone who knows how to handle and be in, in, a, in a healthy, fulfilling relationship. It is the consciousness that is more important than the thing. Someone could just come and hand you whatever it is you want right now. But the question is, is your consciousness really ready for it? To manage it, to support it, to maintain it, if you were given that right now? Michael Beckwood says, you can have anything you want in life, but first you must become it in consciousness. So praying for the consciousness of the thing that you want to have or create is a vital and powerful and uh, important thing. And the last one is, to get away from co coveting is be a giver, be a helper, help other people achieve, have other people do great and, and wonderful things, and you'll realize how blessed our lives are. You know, the good things will happen to them, good things will happen to us, and that circulation of goodness will flow and, and, and increase in our lives. We will not be wanting their stuff because when we help them create their stuff, it'll start increasing more good in our own lives. So the mother superior was on her deathbed after a long, long life of great service. Uh, the other sisters, you know, saw that she was in discomfort, so they offered her a glass of warm milk. And so when they went back to warm up the milk, they noticed a bottle of whiskey that was given last Christmas, of course, never used, 
And they know that um, the uh, Mother Superior has never had a drop of alcohol in her life. And it was kind of tough, but they preferred the greater concern of her comfort being eased or her, her discomfort. And uh, so they did a, poured a couple of shots of whiskey uh, in the milk. So they held it up to her mouth. She took a sip. And then she took another sip and another sip. And next thing you know, it was done. And she was asking for a second glass of warm milk. And she downed that down too. And then as the time came closer for her passing, uh, the other sisters came and they said, um, Mother Superior, you know, you're not going to be with us that much longer. Is there any wisdom you have? Is there any guidance you have that will help us, you know, after you've gone? And she smiled and she said, yes. Don't ever sell that cow. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that is a certain level of wisdom. <laughs> but the real wisdom is the wisdom in the Ten Commandments. Now, on a literal level, they are powerful and helpful for our lives and how we conduct ourselves. But a spiritual level, they take us deeper and really do open, when we understand and apply them, the flow of God's goodness and abundance. Commandment number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against uh, thy neighbor. And it is saying, instead, bear witness to the power of being more honest and truthful in our regular lives. And bear witness to the power of the truth, regardless of what the facts or the circumstance or appearances say, that God is your source, that all things will work together for your highest good. And the Tenth Commandment is, do not covet, you know, anything from, from, from your neighbor. And what it is saying is that to use your power as a powerful spiritual being, use your desire, you know, use your consciousness and become a giver. And you'll realize there'll be no need to ever covet because you can create whatever it is, it is you desire. And those are the lessons from the Ten Commandments. God bless you all.